It seemed like a great idea. The world's largest oil producing company pumping millions of barrels a day to become the world's largest ever traded stock. Aramco is in a part of the main part of this vision for the economy and the economy of the Arab country. An overambitious prince eager to make his mark as a reformer wanted to partially trade Saudi Aramco for a valuation of $2 trillion. But the venture failed to get off the ground, and the prince's vision 2030 now seems blurry. Saudi Aramco is almost like the basis of politics in Saudi Arabia. They are always intrinsically tied. Everybody in Saudi Arabia in one way or another is a beneficiary of Saudi Aramco. Uh, a strong Saudi Arabia needs a strong Aramco and vice versa as well. The history of Saudi Aramco is the history of Saudi Arabia transforming itself from an isolated tribal society into a global presence. Get it right, you reap a windfall. Get it wrong, and the risk is huge. The whole Saudi economy was at stake. There's always a balance between how that you face the risk and to adopt with a new paradigm in the world. They run the risk of being toppled. The royal family could be running for the hill. The issue is really, you know, is an IPO best for the company? And when you look at Aramco, the company, you have to realize that unlike other companies, Aramco operated for years without ever imagining an IPO. So they've never had to make decisions with the thought of, oh, we're someday maybe going to be publicly listed or we'd like to publicly list. Here's how we need to have our finances arrayed. Here's the kind of growth that we need to be showing in our financial statements to make investors see our value. Analysts have never followed Aramco because it was never seen as a potential investment. And now that's changing. Aramco for many years has had a strategy of long-term growth and long-term revenue uh, because their idea was that they were making money for the benefit of the Saudi state. If they're going to IPO, then they've got to suddenly think about their quarterly reports. And that may change how they invest. And that may not be the best strategy for Saudi Arabia. The kingdom holds about 16% of the world's oil reserves. It's the largest exporter of petroleum among OPEC countries. And that means its economy relies heavily on oil. 90% of exports, 87% of budget revenues, nearly half of GDP all comes from oil. Towering over these numbers is the company which digs out, refines, and exports that oil. It pumps one out of every eight barrels of oil in the world, and it's the only company which can produce a barrel of oil for less than $10. Aramco says it employs 65,000 people, but creates direct and indirect work for hundreds of thousands in the kingdom. So if it's doing so well, why let it go? I think there was a strong case for the IPO, and there still is for the selling off a stake of Saudi Aramco. And there are lots of reasons for it. Now, it's been talking about diversifying its economy for years. I think the specter of climate action has finally made the Saudis get serious about it. Uh, and really, the only way to diversify is through Aramco. I mean, Aramco is the source of revenues that the Saudi state needs to build other economic sectors. Even the reserve is big in other countries, you know, in Middle East, but still, there's depletable resources. Someday, somehow, the oil will be depleted, will be exhausted. So they have to think that, you know, you have to diversify your energy and the economy. So it's kind of ironic you're going to be relying on oil to diversify away from fossil fuels. So if you think about Saudi risk, it's 100% owner of this company that supplies almost 100% of its government budget, okay? If, they, if it sees a risk to, to that company, even a far off risk, it's, it needs to start diversifying that risk. Uh, and passing some of that along to foreign investors is one way of doing it. Concerns about radical changes in strategy put a spanner in the works for Saudi Aramco's public listing. For the first time in its history, the company would have to disclose 
everything. I think when you consider the size and scope and the opportunity, there's a lot of emotion and also a lot of momentum. And sometimes when momentum and emotion get rolling, you may lose sight of the reality of what you had to do when it came to effectively being now an open public company. نقف معك أيها المستقبل. Vision 2030 was unveiled as a master plan for socioeconomic reforms. As a result, women can drive. Cinemas have begun to pop up. Mohammed bin Salman's aim was to reorient the Saudi economy away from oil and reassure investors that Saudi Arabia is stable and progressive. A lot has changed since the prince's international public relations drive. The efforts to convince businessmen to feel comfortable working in the kingdom also faced a blow when top Saudi business kingpins were put under arrest in an opaque anti-corruption drive. And as a cascading effect, there has been flight of capital, reduced foreign investment, increased Saudi borrowing, and a halt on Saudi Aramco's IPO. The increase in internal repression inside the kingdom, you know, locking up of folks inside the, the Ritz-Carlton. Uh, a lot of those were, uh, you know, heads of family businesses or large companies or uh, big conglomerates. Um, you know, that gives foreign investors pause. The murder of one journalist has washed away the veneer of change and quashed investor confidence. I'm not asking for democracy. I'm asking for people to be allowed to speak. I'm, I'm, I'm asking for the minimum. Can the interest of a stakeholder ever get priority over the kingdom? The privatization process would mean Saudi oil reserves will be up for scrutiny and Ramco's finances will be in the public eye. You go from running a business where you have endless resources and no oversight to one day having to register your company with the exchange and having to disclose every single number the company's had over the last five to 10 years. Every piece of CapEx, every decision that's been made, every partnership, every single thing you've done is now in the public purview. Once that we move to the public control, the state companies, I think that's begin by the transparency because the company uh, is not only belong to the, to the state, to the government, but belongs also to, to, to the public. If you're a private company that's run so well, it's painful because you have to answer a lot of questions. But not nearly as painful as after you take people's money. Those Saudi economists who dared to raise concerns about the prince's ambitious 2030 plans are in jail. لا يمكن أن تصل قيمة أرامكو إلى اثنين أو ثلاثة تريليون دولار إلا إذا كانت كل إيرادات النفط ستذهب لهذه الشركة. A day before the Khashoggi murder, prominent economist Issam al-Zamal was indicted on terrorism-related charges. His crime was providing analysis, some of which explained that a high valuation of Aramco could mean that the kingdom will not get any oil revenue for decades, because all of it will go to an Aramco controlled by shareholders. In the beginning stages, you haven't taken anyone's money, presumably. You're just disclosing to the exchanges, here's how we run our business, here's why you should be comfortable listing us. You then go out to raise capital. And once you're taking someone else's money, they own those shares. And you're a company for the people, by the people. You're not a company for the manage management or the, or the kingdom. And the transition's massive. That changeover from state control to a public listing, which began in 2017, is now shelved for years to come. Key Aramco executives have also left or been moved. So that process for a company like this, probably a year and a half. It's not like a tech startup where you have a, a slide presentation and some hope. You have a business that changes global markets for decades and decades. So it's a process that will be expansive it will be intrusive, and it will be transformative. Saudi Aramco places the kingdom's reserves at 261 billion barrels of oil, 
But that magic number with no real third-party audit has remained more or less constant for nearly 30 years. Since the 1980s, there have been rising production, changes in technology, and no announcements of major oil discoveries in the kingdom. Other oil giants such as Shell and Exxon have revised down their reserves during this period. If on average Saudi production was at 9 million barrels a day, in the last 30 years, Aramco has pumped out nearly 100 billion barrels without a dent in its 261 billion reserves. And the jury's out on how much they actually have and what it's worth. Looking at their reserves figure is, you know, makes, if you look too closely at it, you start to wonder how it can stay roughly constant from year to year when they're, they're producing and exporting so much oil uh, uh, every year. Disclosure of the reserves, it's a top secret in Saudi Arabia. And I think this is a significant concern on the part of Aramco executives. They treat their reserves with kid gloves. Their duty is to get the most out of these reserves in the best way possible. The reserve confidence will only be consistent with third parties verifying the information. It's got to be done through a regulatory fashion that everyone's comfortable with. It can't just be something a company says and, and hopes is the case. You've got to verify. Whatever other qualities God may have given the Saudis, he gave them a lot of wealth in the ground. And um, that's not going to go away. So one might quibble over the, over the reserves. Uh, but, um, you know, the Saudis have the ability to do fracking. And they haven't even started, basically. But would that possibility of higher reserves be enough for investors to finance Aramco's IPO? Probably the biggest downside is the transparency that would have resulted around Saudi reserves, Saudi oil reserves. That doesn't change very much from year to year and really hasn't changed much over the past couple of decades. Doesn't give much insight beyond this single number, you know, around 260 billion barrels. If Saudi Aramco would have listed shares in the New York Stock Exchange or the London Stock Exchange, the uh, uh, regulators would have forced Saudi Arabia to come clean on all of its reserves, uh, you know, how much of that is proven probable or otherwise. I think that, that'd be a, that's a tough sell within the kingdom, uh, within Saudi Aramco and within the ministry and all the way up to the head of state. I don't think Saudi Arabia is not trustworthy when it comes to their reserves. I think the reserves are there, but the capacity is another question. Saudi Aramco has never produced 12 and a half million barrels a day. Uh, and has never come within about a million barrels a day of that. Aramco says that it can reach that level of capacity after a, a period of about six months of additional investment, right? So it can't just twist a few valves uh, and, and crank up an extra two million barrels a day. I can remember on one occasion, um, s uh, sitting in the office of the then uh, Minister of Petroleum, who did not know that I understood Arabic, um, when one of his aides came rushing in and said, we've got, we've proved the reserves in this particular new field they'd found. And he said, well, how much is it? And they said, uh, three billion barrels. And he said, oh, it's too small, cap it. Well, that's twice the Alaska reserve. If you had full access to, uh, to Aramco's reserves figures and, uh, you know, other inside details about its revenue streams and whatnot. You know, anybody with a smartphone could, could second guess the Saudi minister. You know, right now when the, uh, when the oil minister goes to Vienna to speak in public at, a, at an OPEC meeting, I mean, you can see him just surrounded by hordes of reporters, each you know, shoving their voice recorder uh, in his face to catch a little you know, snippet of you know, what he says about you know, Saudi plans, Saudi reserves, Saudi oil production. Um, you know, Saudi, Saudi market strategy. The world wouldn't be as quite as dependent uh, on the oil minister for information, you know, to sort of unlock the, uh, you know, the secrets of what Aramco was going to do. Also, you know, you put those, those, that information out there, it's out there for everyone. 
We should just uh, be dynamic and uh, responsive. The reserves matter because the reserves and output give Saudi Arabia the regional and international clout as the largest producer in the oil-producing club of nations known as OPEC. Vacation, travel, lodging, billions and billions and billions of dollars of industry get moved by OPEC. And OPEC being a Saudi-driven organization, they have to be meticulous. The company is so good at what it does that that also brings its leaders a certain amount of political clout when it comes to OPEC and when it comes to other um, dealings with other countries. OPEC is not the cartel. You know, uh, we really want to stabilize the oil price to some extent. You know, the unity of OPEC, I think, is still important to how then we can bring together the stabilizer of the price. But it's not the price that benefit only the producer. It's the price that also benefit the producer and consumer. The history of OPEC, we're an economic organization focused on fundamentals, focused on addressing the global market's needs for reliable supplies of petroleum. Saudi Arabia is the keystone in OPEC. It is the big dog. It's the ringleader, if you will, uh, uh, within OPEC. OPEC members maintain a little bit here and there. Um, none has more than one million barrels per day of spare oil production capacity that, that I know of. It maintains that, that kind of level of spare capacity uh, at, you know, as, as a policy. Saudi Arabia and Saudi Aramco typically maintain you know, a million, two million barrels, two million barrels a, a day of oil production capacity that they don't use, okay? So no profit-oriented firm would ever do this, right? You wouldn't invest all the billions in developing oil fields and pipelines and storage facilities and production infrastructure, and then just leave it dormant. Saudi Aramco has done it at the behest of the, the Saudi state, um, and, you know, it's, it's the key aspect in the Saudi-U.S. partnership, Aramco's ability to bring more oil production online and its willingness to cut back uh, at times when markets are oversupplied. It's kind of the crux of the, the U.S. and Saudi strategic partnership. Saudi Arabia, uh, if we broke with them, I think your oil prices would go through the roof. I've kept them down. They've helped me keep them down. Right now we have low oil prices or relatively, I'd like to see it go down even lower. Billions of dollars are traded at the world's largest stock exchange. It's business as usual on Wall Street, but like other exchanges around the world, it also tried to sway Saudi Aramco to list in New York. Even the U.S. president weighed in on his preferred medium of communication. But the strict requirements remained a deterrent for the IPO, which was being called the world's largest offering. It would be a double whammy for Mohammed bin Salman to not get the $2 trillion valuation and having to compromise on not listing on the world's largest stock market. You're the world's largest oil producer and you don't list in the world's largest stock exchange, that definitely says something. Uh, and it definitely limits your access to capital. New York is terribly complicated by virtue of the 9-11 hangover. So I thought from the beginning it was quite, you know, it was a nice thing to dangle before the Americans but it was probably not going to come to us. You know, there aren't that many exchanges that can do this. So London and New York were the two main ones that, um, that, that could really handle something like this, both of which have pretty stringent transparency requirements, New York's more so. Um, London was signaling that it was willing to roll back uh, some of its transparency requirements and make a special deal for Aramco. The Prince's IPO hit the brakes, from a lofty $2 trillion valuation to uncertainty about the size of Saudi reserves. From litigation risks to stringent requirements from stock exchanges, the reality was different from the political statements. Well, I think the $2 trillion number was significant for Saudis, but not significant for the rest of the market. You're talking about a business that dwarfs almost every business in the S&P 500. I would say $2 trillion is a high valuation. It's not unachievable. When you look at what the size of it is, whether it's a trillion, a 
trillion and a half or two trillion, the scale is all relative. It's massive. And so if you have a business that's earning 200, 300, 400 billion dollars a year, there's a multiple put on that. And the market's gonna say, well, even though you're a trillion dollar business, give or take, whether you're one trillion or three trillion, is gonna be dependent on your earnings and your decline curves and your growth strategy. What type of growth percentage can I put on your business? It's a huge number, there's no question about it. Uh, whether you look at the high level or you look at the low level, it's huge. It's a huge IPO, it's a huge company. And so I guess what you're asking me is, how do they expect to sell it? I think there's enough of money out there that can cover it. But if, on the other hand, the global economy should begin to tick downward, then it's going to be a hard sell. They would have to lower the price. Putting a line in the sand is, is strong and smart from your own perspective, but the market's going to determine what they feel comfortably about buying your stock at. That's worth what someone tells you it's worth, not what you hope it's worth. So when Mohammed bin Salman announced the Ramco IPO, and he basically said, we're looking for a valuation of $2 trillion. And that's the largest valuation of all time for any company. And that's a valuation for the whole company. They were never talking about selling any more than 5%. So it seems like they're looking to raise $100 billion, which is a large amount, but not that much. So, um, the qu but the question is really, is a Ramco valued at $2 trillion. Um, what are their oil reserves valued at? Which is really tends to be the bulk of what makes up an oil company valuation. Now, Aramco also has a lot of other assets around the world, not oil, not upstream oil assets, but they own shares in refineries in China, in South Korea. They own uh, oil storage facilities in Japan. They own the largest oil refinery in the United States. And they also have a lot of research and development uh, things going on. They've also got petrochemical and oil refineries in Saudi Arabia. So the company is worth more than what they dig out of the ground and sell. But does that get us to $2 trillion? The answer also depends on what the price of oil is at the time of the IPO. And when they announced the IPO, we were in the midst of a, very, a period of very low oil prices. So you could see how it would be very hard to reach a $2 trillion valuation in say 2017 when the price of oil was you know, 50 or $55 a barrel. It's an indirect evaluation of the Saudi economy which is reliant on Aramco. So it's not just a company with a proposed $2 trillion price tag. There's a major problem with valuing the company. Uh, what is it that's being um, offered? Some slice of the overall company, I guess, but no direct ownership of any part of it. How much are the reserves after all? Are they understated or overstated? What level of efficiency does Saudi Aramco have in comparison with other oil companies? Uh, where is the future market? Mohammed bin Salman's vision was to take the money from the IPO to revamp the Saudi Public Investment Fund, which would play a leading role in developing non-oil industries. But that fund has already started borrowing money instead of stacking up oil revenues. The tens of billions expected from Aramco never arrived, and global banks provided their first ever loan of $11 billion. The IPO, it seems to be, from what people say, was designed to generate cash for the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia, which is designed to make investments for the future, not to use for the Saudi budget, not to use for, for those kind of projects, but really a sovereign wealth fund to rely on, you know, when oil is uh, no longer an important commodity. Here you have a company which has been deliberately non-transparent. It's not listed on any market. It has no shareholders other than the kingdom itself to which to report. Saudi Arabia is not a notably free press environment and uh, it is not a democracy and accountability is uncertain.
The kingdom is home to the most important religious sites for Muslims, but Saudi Arabia's real source of power is its oil wealth, and Aramco converts that black gold into dollars and rials. Many academics, experts, and oil economists either refused or refrained from speaking to us. As soon as they heard it's about Aramco, the kingdom's most potent economic firepower. The Saudis can't use oil as a weapon. Look, OPEC did it in 1973. They put an embargo. And what happened to the price of oil? It shot up over $100. A few years ago, we saw oil prices tumble. Who created that? It was the Saudis. They flooded the market. Why? They wanted to put shallow oil out of business. Well, it backfired. The partnership between the US and Saudi Arabia rests on linked interests, many of which have either disappeared or are now problematic. The basic bargain of uh, preferred access to energy in return for security protection. But the United States is now the swing producer internationally for oil, given fracking. And we're an energy exporter, not dependent on the Gulf. The support that the Saudis provided by making uh, American foreign policy halal, uh, acceptable to Muslims. Uh, now the Muslim world is so divided and the United States is so Islamophobic that that bargain is gone. Saudi Arabia also controls a vast media empire. For decades, it spent tens of millions of dollars to lobby cultural institutions, think tanks, universities, even governments, all to improve the kingdom's image. That's jumped from $10 million spent in 2016 to more than $27 million today, used to fuel a sophisticated Saudi influence machine. That money shapes policy and perceptions, and it also covers up criticism of the kingdom. Much of this was revealed in 2015 when WikiLeaks published thousands of cable exchanges between Saudi diplomats posted abroad and the foreign ministry. Houston, Texas is an oil town. It's a testament to Saudi soft power and how big Saudi money is securely invested in the U.S. regardless of what Saudi Arabia is accused of. Even a local marathon here is sponsored by Aramco. But whether it's 9-11 or the murder of the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi, it all continues to cast a shadow over the kingdom's image abroad. In terms of JASTA, which is the law that was passed basically saying that citizens could sue uh, the Saudi government for the role in 9-11. In um, that has been put forward as a reason not to list on the New York Stock Exchange. I'm not a lawyer, but it would not be a real concern at all. Evidence that at least that's available that the US government has presented and declassified is not significant enough to probably convict or, or to get a um, a ruling, you know, to be able to sue the Saudi government. So there's that. But say it was. Um, then the question is, okay, so what kind of assets can you go after? And if you're saying that Aramco is an asset of the Saudi government and therefore should pay, well, there's already a lot of Aramco investment in the United States that they can go after. Uh, you know, they can go after Motiva, the largest refinery. They have research centers all over. There's Aramco headquarters, it, Aramco services company in, in America. Uh, I think that that's a convenient excuse to give, but if they wanted to list on the New York Stock Exchange, it's not really a significant barrier. Motiva's the largest refinery in the United States, which goes through a whopping 600,000 barrels a day. It's more than 2,000 employees work near the Gulf of Mexico, but this behemoth facility isn't U.S. owned. It's a subsidiary of Aramco, the centerpiece of Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's Vision 2030. He wants to expand the petrochemicals business instead of the kingdom's heavy reliance on oil sales. Motiva is so influential in Port Arthur that Motiva security sent a policeman to stop us from filming. 
They even called the police to hold us until they could question why journalists were filming their facility. Despite tight control over media and any opinion which doesn't fall in line with that of the kingdom, efforts to privatize have been a hard sell at home. With very little accountability of the ruling family, radical changes are viewed with suspicion by many ordinary Saudis. One of the major objections by people in the kingdom was their fear that the money would go into the pockets of the royal family rather than be used in a transparent way to provide government services to the people. In other words, um, waste, fraud, and mismanagement are a concern on the part of the public. They're also concerned by foreigners. I think the Crown Prince is trying to create an environment conducive to foreign investment. But uh, events, things keep happening, questions keep getting raised that make that difficult. Saudi Arabia's geopolitical power is, to, is the exclusive access to information about Saudi reserves. They hold that information uh, uh, very close and they let it out in, in dribs and drabs. It's almost like the strategic ambiguity around the Israeli nuclear weapons capability. They release what they choose to release when they choose to release it. That's a, a source of power. Very similar with the oil reserves in Saudi Arabia. This is not the first time reforms have been promised in Saudi Arabia or the first time when those promises have been lapped up by Western powers and lauded by the media. Since the 1950s, the New York Times, which likes to be called the newspaper of record, has given similar coverage to Saudi kings and princes. The media has given them titles such as trailblazers and reformers, similar to the current crown prince. Even the glitzy 2030 roadmap hints at old promises. Well, the vision itself is hardly new. This was largely drawn up, uh, I gather, by consultants, uh, McKinsey in particular. Um, and they were able to do that quickly because the Ministry of Planning in Saudi Arabia had all these ideas um, there to be gathered up. Uh, so the vision isn't new. Um, the drive for change in the kingdom, transformative drive, is also not new. In many ways, Mohammed bin Salman resembles his grandfather, uh, Abdulaziz al Saud. Different methods. Abdulaziz united the kingdom with uh, tribal marriages, uh, a bewildering number of uh, marriages and divorces that brought different groups in the society in, in, into his family. He conducted a war in the Saudi South, in Ajran, Jizan. Asir, which took land from Yemen and made it definitively part of Saudi Arabia. He suppressed religious uprisings. There are many similarities, one could say, and it worked. Whether the current drive will work or not is unknown. It's really not the first time uh, claims of reform have been made in Saudi Arabia. Um, for example, King Faisal, when he became king, he made a lot of very uh, important changes and reforms in Saudi Arabia that um, before that the, the government had been spending very recklessly and carelessly under uh, King, his brother, King Saud. It was reported, actually, that he would um, carry around in his pocket the, the budget. And whenever he would see a minister, say, in the halls or something, he would question them. And he would say, how are you spending this money? What are you doing with it? So this is not the first time that, that reforms have been tried. Probably every previous king in Saudi Arabia has announced it to some extent. And there have been uh, one, one of the key aspects, I think, that a lot of the reform plans always include are mega projects. And in my mind, those mega projects never really pan out. And so those, that's always something to be wary of. We can hold up the Aramco IPO as the key example of that, but there were lots of other privatizations that would have really helped kind of um, remove, move Saudi Arabia's economy from very state, statist based to a much more diverse uh, and vibrant private economy. So, for example, they wanted to sell parts of Saudi Airlines, of, of different national companies. And it really almost seems like the reverse is happening, that the state is actually more involved in the economy as opposed to less involved. And that, I think, is probably not a good sign for developing a diverse and vibrant private economy. But at the same time, there are shifts in cultural and social expectations. 
that have to occur in Saudi Arabia. And so those changes, I think setting a year of 2030 was probably very um, ambitious. I think the Saudis realize that the time has come, that they must change the way they run the economy, the way they do business. Otherwise, look what happened with Iraq. Look what happened with Iran. Look what happened with Libya. It's not too far-fetched to think that that can't happen with Saudi Arabia. And utilities has become a burden. It's had to borrow aggressively to plug the budget deficit. Well, the budgetary uh, crisis is not new. Uh, I did have a conversation with uh, the late, uh, then Crown Prince uh, Abdullah, later King Abdullah, uh, who made a real effort in the late 90s uh, to institute a, a, a tax uh, system other than zakat. Um, and, and the conversation went like this. I, I said to him, you know, I think you have a problem here because, uh, for example, in the United States, if I take a section of desert, let's say part of Nevada, and I either invest my own money or I borrow money from a bank and I build an industrial estate, a park, uh, and a related community, and I don't ask the government for anything, the government still has to come up with all sorts of services, police, education, wastewater management, road maintenance, even if I build the roads initially, and so forth. Um, and the same is true in Saudi Arabia, ev except even more so, because at that time, at least, Saudi Arabia was heavily subsidizing electricity and water and other things that people needed. So uh, I said, you know, the difference is that in Nevada, every cent will come back in the form of increased government revenue. Uh, so the, 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 the debt will be uh, replaced by a stream of revenue that um, makes the government whole and enables a, a higher level of service. Whereas in Saudi Arabia, not one halal comes back. Basically, you have a system, I said, in which private prosperity impoverishes the government. It's the opposite of normal economics. So I've said to people, um, I'll give you a, a, a real majlis, a real parliament, and a role in allocating tax resources, but in order to do that, you've got to pay taxes. And he said, I came very close to getting a consensus on this. In the end, I failed. The merchants, particularly in the Western province, uh, would not agree. So it's difficult to, to rationalize a big investment uh, in a country um, that's already a hard sell for investors anyway because of, you know, the, the visa requirements and red tape and, you know, the lifestyle issues in Saudi Arabia, a lot of, a lot of foreigners. It's not, a, it's not a, you know, considered a, a great destination for, uh, you know, for second homeowners or for, uh, you know, a, a foreigners who are looking to uh, move their families and put their kids in the local schools. Um, you know, they would go to Dubai or Bahrain or Abu Dhabi or Doha to go to the region. Um, so it's, you know, Saudi Arabia's never been a real easy sell for foreign investment for the size of its economy. Uh, FDI flows there aren't proportionally as big as they are for some of the more open economies around the region. Perhaps the biggest challenge to the Saudi economy comes from the wave of change in the way the country is being run. Mohammed bin Salman's pursuit of Vision 2030 has upset the traditional order. In 2015, when uh, King Salman ascended to the throne, in short order, within a year, all power was essentially transferred into the hands of his favorite son, Mohammed bin Salman. This destroyed the consultative tradition within the royal family and more broadly in the kingdom. Here you had a, a young man with great ambition, drive, imagination, uh, determined to change things, impatient, and uh, not willing to wait for consultation. So a lot of egos have been bruised, a lot of interests have been shaken. Um, many people have uh, lodged objections uh, to this fundamental change in the constitutional order in Saudi Arabia. This is before you get to things like um, uh, the uh, anti-corruption drive, which uh, exacted huge amounts of money from the wealthy elite in the kingdom. 
King Salman will be the last king of his generation. It had always passed from brother to brother to brother, and it's clear, even though there are still some living brothers or, or sons of Abdul Aziz, it has been decided that Salman will be the last of that generation. The next generation, there are a lot of princes there, and a lot of them had a great deal of control and in certain segments of the economy and, and, and of Saudi society. And there had always been kind of a balancing act that went on between these different uh, segments of the royal family. There have been a lot of tensions produced. Basically, traditionally in Saudi Arabia and in Gulf Arab societies, generally uh, the king or the, or the emir, the leader, has the same responsibilities as the sheikh in a tribe. There's really two responsibilities. One is to uh, ensure that decisions are taken by consensus after consultation. He proclaims a consensus, does not um, make a decision and impose it. Uh, second uh, responsibility is to ensure that the less fortunate, the poor, uh, share the wealth. So it's a the government, or the, in this case, the leader, must distribute alms, charity, uh, to the needy. The Saudi state is built on these principles. The first one has been badly compromised, as power has been gathered into one man's hands, or perhaps two, um, the crown prince and his father. The members of the family, the ruling family who were previously consulted, I feel excluded in many cases from the decision-making process. They would kind of all meet and had to agree together on things, almost like different shareholders. And it does appear that that process is changing. I would be cautious of, of saying, well, it's now different. Everything is different now. It's a one-man show. Uh, that may be the image that um, they'd like to present to everyone, but that doesn't mean that all of the other sources of power have necessarily been eliminated and that um, you know, if uh, enough brothers decide that um, Mohammed bin Salman is not the right way, that that couldn't be changed. I, I think we're, it's too early to write off that process and to say that he has fully consolidated power. <laughs> million dollars, that's peanuts for you. Should've increased it. From lucrative military contracts to support for each other's wars, there is a special relationship between the U.S. president, the Saudi king, and Mohammed bin Salman. Always the right hand, right? Always the right hand. But that special relationship has been under stress lately. And I love the king, King Salman, but I said, King, we're protecting you. You might not be there for two weeks without us. You have to pay for your military. We filmed this during the period when the Saudi government was officially denying that its agents murdered journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The government later confessed to the killing at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul and admitted it was a premeditated murder. A lot of fingers are pointed at the crown prince for allegedly ordering the killing in Turkey but the U.S. president still has unwavering support for Mohammed bin Salman. I don't know if anyone's going to be able to conclude that the crown prince did it, but uh, I will say this, I, I don't know, I don't know. But whether he did or whether he didn't, uh, he denies it vehemently. His father denies it, the king, vehemently. The case remains open regardless of Saudi denials and criminal sentences. It risks the prince's grip on power, foreign investment, Vision 2030, and Aramco's IPO. Despite several attempts, Aramco and its subsidiaries did not respond to our request for interviews. The killing of the Saudi journalist, that has put them in the spotlight. And if they come forward and tell the whole truth of what happened, then that will be a sign that they're really ready for change. If not, they may be faced with harsh economic sanctions, 
And if that's the case, the market seems to be saying, well, Saudi Arabia's economy is going to fall off a cliff. On the foreign policy front, the kingdom has lurched into a series of adventures, none of which have turned out well. It is stuck with a garrison, along with others from the Gulf, Gulf Cooperation Council in Bahrain, uh, where unrest continues and uh, shows no sign of abating. Uh, it, is, it has become uh, really uh, battered uh, by Syria, which has been a transformative um, situation in the Middle East, it's brought the Russians back in as the major foreign player, for example. Um, Saudi Arabia's relationships with Turkey have been badly damaged um, uh, by this. Uh, it has uh, s seen fit to divide itself from Qatar uh, and, uh, and conduct a blockade, which again shows no sign of going away, and which essentially divides the Gulf Cooperation Council irreparably. And finally, of course, it is engaged in a war in Yemen uh, with no clear objective that is feasible and uh, no war termination strategy. Saudi Aramco's failure to launch and a young leader's stumble from one crisis to another are directly linked. There is an urgency to rush into things, but also a lack of experience. That is really like planning for the growth of a nation, not the exit of an IPO. And the growth of the nation takes a lot more planning than a couple months. And ultimately, you see they've pulled back, I would guess because they recognize that this is a transformational moment that's going to take a lot more time and energy to get into the, the realm of the public markets if they ever get comfortable. They may never be comfortable with it. I know there are elements within Saudi society who don't want to see that change. And they feel that this is too much and too soon and too big. And um, the pushback from the government has been, they need to be dragged kicking and screaming into these changes and that's just the way it's going to be. I see that as a much bigger backlash than even the religious or conservative people uh, is really unemployment and Saudis not taking jobs or um, they've made a big push to get rid of foreign labor in Saudi Arabia. But the problem is that if you're not replacing that with Saudi labor, then you're not gonna have a, a, an economy. If people aren't taking jobs and unemployment remains high despite there being jobs, then you've got a significant problem. And I see that really as the biggest threat to the changes. They can make all the decrees they want, but if people don't work, if people aren't working and making money, and they don't see that as a valuable part of their lives, then you're not gonna pacify people with movie theaters. It's ultimately a function of how fast they want to get to their end goal, which none of us know at, at the moment. Their industry is obviously oil, but they need to be more open. And that's the key. Saudi Arabia has to make it on its own to an extent it never did. And so far, it seems to be having difficulty. Right now, there's no substitute for oil. So it's, oil's not going to go away in the short term. You know, the writing is on the wall, and the Saudis have, have read it. The Saudi crown prince is adamant that he is the harbinger of change. He may have the desire, but what he can actually achieve remains the big question. I think that Europe is a new country in the Middle East. This was the media-savvy prince's first public appearance three weeks after the murder of Jamal Khashoggi at an event widely referred to as Davos in the desert.